Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam, and today we will be reviewing part four of my Bold Predictions video series. If you have not watched parts one, two, and or three of this series, I encourage you to do so, especially part three, as that is the video where I reviewed your own bold predictions that you commented in part one. I'll provide links for all of those videos down in the description below, so you can click on those and watch them. I could not have done this video series without you guys, so I want to give you all a thanks and a big shout out. And to keep the series going until the end of the preseason in late August, please like this video and watch it all the way through so we can get it into the algorithm and comment your own bold predictions down in the comment section. Without further ado, I'm going to kick this video off with my seventh bold prediction of the preseason, and that is that USC will lose to Oregon, Utah, and Washington, and they will go 9-3. The USC Trojans last year went 11-3. They were 12th in the final AP poll. They were 8-1, 8-1 in the Pac-12 conference. So already losing to three conference foes in the regular season implies regression in Pac-12 play, going from 8-1 to 6-3. USC did lose to Utah last year, but they did not play Oregon or Washington. Instead, they played Utah once, and then Utah again in the Pac-12 championship game, losing to them both times. Offense was not a problem for the Trojans, and it's never been the problem for Lincoln Riley. The Trojans were third nationally in scoring offense, scoring 41.4 points per game, and they had Heisman-winning quarterback Caleb Williams on the roster, who's returning for another year this season. Caleb Williams is 6'1", 215 pounds. He had an 87.6 quarterback efficiency ranking according to ESPN last season, which was fifth in the country. He had 42 passing touchdowns, five passing interceptions, and he had 4,537 passing yards, and he had another 10 touchdowns and 382 yards on the ground. Caleb Williams, unlike, let's say, Stetson Bennett, or C.J. Stroud, or even J.J. McCarthy, and maybe even Bryce Young at Alabama did not have the same supporting staff that a lot of great teams provide their quarterback. He had a great offensive line, but not an elite one. Tight ends were rarely used, and I would say would have been about average. The wide receiver core was near elite, but outside of Jordan Addison, I think there were playmakers that, while great, weren't that X-Factor unicorn wide receiver, like let's say Marvin Harrison Jr. or Emeka Ibuka at Ohio State, or even Xavier Worthy in 2022, where he had some problems catching the football, but nonetheless a very explosive, talented young man at the receiver position, or even a speedster like Troy Franklin, or just some more reliable wide receivers like let's say Malik Neighbors at LSU. USC has guys like Brendan Rice. They also have Dorian Singer coming in from Arizona, who's one of the best wide receivers in the Pac-12 last year. And they have Mario Williams, who originally was at Oklahoma, but transferred over to USC when Lincoln Riley left the Sooners for the Trojans. Those are some great wide receivers, maybe even near elite wide receivers. But Jordan Addison was an elite first round NFL wide receiver. He won the 2021 Bolitnikoff Award. So there's going to be some drop-off, in my opinion, at the wide receiver position. Andrew Voorhees left the program. It was an awesome offensive lineman, very strong. Unfortunately, tore his ACL and still just dominated in the bench press and the strength department. There are three incoming transfers that look to start on the offensive line for USC, according to rlads.com. Tight end, Deuce Robinson will be an immediate impact freshman. And at running back, Travis Dye left the program, but Austin Jones, starter from last season, who took over fully when Dye was hurt, he's returning. And Marshawn Lloyd, a transfer coming in from South Carolina, who is awesome and great when healthy, he should be the backup to Austin Jones. 
and Caleb Williams, of course, at quarterback. So the offense, while I expect maybe some slight regression, is still going to be great. I expect them to score north of 40 points per game. I expect Caleb Williams to actually improve, even though his supporting cast should regress. Another year under Lincoln Riley, and as much heat as Lincoln Riley often gets, the offense and quarterback is never the problem. Never the problem. He's produced first-round quarterback after first-round quarterback. The only quarterback under his leadership that hasn't necessarily worked out is Spencer Rattler, who had one of the highest passer ratings in the country in 2020 and might end up being a good quarterback this season at South Carolina. But we'll have to see. The defense, the defense is where all the problems have always resided for Lincoln Riley. It's the defense. It's like what Ohio State fans would talk about with Ryan Day, except it's actually much worse than that, because Ryan Day has never had an overall terrible defense, unless you maybe want to count 2021. It's just been certain parts of the defense that haven't necessarily functioned correctly. For USC last year, and I know it was year one, and I know that before then, Clay Helton and his staff were mediocre all around, and they didn't care about the defense much, as they liked to run an air raid. But regardless, brought in tons of transfers. They played in a, the Pac-12 South schedule, because even though divisions were abolished, they kept the divisional schedules. USC had the 94th best scoring defense in the country. And I think that Oregon, Utah, and Washington will all have top 10 offenses. All will be able to run the football well. Washington will have one of the best passing offenses in the country, potentially the best. It, it will be comparable with Ohio State's, their wide receiver core and even quarterback play will, which says a lot about Washington because Ohio State's number one in that realm. Utah will have a top five running back room. Oregon might be the fastest offense in the land. And USC hosts Utah and Washington, but they also play on the road at Oregon. And I think all those teams also have better strength and conditioning staffs, are physically tougher, and are better, deeper, bigger, and faster at the offensive line positions. So that's the reason I have USC going 9-3. and three. We'll talk more about the defense here in a few seconds, but... Before that, I want to talk about what this will mean for Alex Grinch, and also for Lincoln Riley, but more importantly for Alex Grinch, because Lincoln Riley is a young head coach. There's no doubt about that. And he can still learn and adapt. There's also no doubt about that. But for Alex Grinch, for after 2017 and his time with Mike Leach, rest in peace, he looks like a great defensive coordinator. That's all but gone. When you allow in Pac-12 play, and also to Tulane, that was potentially the, you know, the final straw, the straw that broke the camel's back, in my mind, and the mind of many USC fans, allowing 40 points in four games to Utah twice, to UCLA once, and to Tulane once, and having special teams blunders, blown coverage, I mean, the Utah game there was a touchdown like of 60 or 50 yards, a touchdown pass by Cameron Rising on 3rd and 11. That was just some of the worst tackling and busted coverage I'd ever seen in the biggest moment. That was the Pac-12 championship game. If USC wins that game, they're in the college football playoff, probably playing Michigan and or Georgia, which I would suspect they would have lost, but you never know. They would have been there instead of Ohio State and Utah beat a good team in USC twice, and that's hard to do. And Alex Grinch is largely responsible for that. So with a 9-3 and record, and USC will, would probably win their bowl game, I presume, because just the massive talent advantage they would have, they'd be ranked low by the college football playoff committee, but probably lower than what their actual team talent is. The Pac-12 is very deep this season, so there could be some 9-3, and 8-4, and four, potentially even 7-5 and five Pac-12 teams that are better than, let's say, some 8-4 and four or even 9-3 and three Big 12 and ACC teams. So bowl season's always interesting for the different reasons of it shows typically how strong the conferences are, how deep they are. It doesn't do a perfect job because of opt-outs and other things, but I suspect, and I actually do project 
USC to win their bowl game, which if you want to see my bowl game projections, which will be in my top 25 videos and my conference prediction videos, hit the notification bell so you can get notified when I release those, and subscribe to the channel as we are less than 100 subscribers away from 10,000, and I will be doing a giveaway there. But Grinch will be fired, and I think that USC is a little you know, bonus opinion, I think they're going to allow over 30 points per game this season. Oregon, Washington, Utah will have fun, potentially too much fun with this defense. USC, not USC, but UCLA. I should not mix up those two schools, but I nearly did. Notre Dame also with Sam Hartman and with Audric Estime at running back and Joe Alt and other good offensive linemen. That is also going to be a tough game. So there are several games where USC's defense has the opportunity to prove me wrong, but also to prove this prediction right. And if they miss the Pac-12 championship game in their final year before the Big Ten, imagine what happens when Alex Grinch faces Big Ten defenses and offenses. Imagine what happens there. Because Big Ten defenses are going to they're going to do a better job at shutting down USC's offense, which is ultimately going to put more pressure on USC's defense. And USC's defense, they're built off pass rush, and they're built off interceptions and forced fumbles. That is not a good strategy, I would say, period, amen, unless you're in the Big 12, which is why it worked at Oklahoma. But especially when you go to the Big 10, who's a run-first conference, who's just identity is often ball security offensive line that's not going to work the, the usc's 335 specifically and i say that because tcu's worked against michigan i think wisconsin's will work with defensive coordinator mike tressel the coordinator and the coaches ultimately matter more than the scheme if you have the perfect scheme but a bad coach versus an elite coach with maybe a slightly outdated scheme the elite coach is going to win it just is what it is. Coaching is that important. I don't think Alex Grinch is even an average or above average defensive coordinator. I think his time is done, and I think he'll be fired after this season. And I'd suspect that Jim Leonard or an underrated defensive coordinator will be hired. I would have said Jeremy Pruitt before the Tennessee sanction sanctions came about, and Jeremy Pruitt now is you know permanently suspended for one year of his first college football job if he ever does return to college football. But Jim Leonard would be a great hire. Maybe you can get, I mean, going bold, but if Kirk Ferentz retires from Iowa, which could be imminent at this point, Phil Parker from Iowa, that would be a phenomenal hire. Or maybe you can get someone else. Who knows? But Alex Grinch, while certainly not the worst defensive coordinator, is far from what USC needs moving forward. And I do have some score predictions for USC's losses that I do want to share, and then we'll move on to my next prediction. I think they're going to lose to Utah and surrender 40 points there or more. Same with Washington, same with Oregon, same with UCLA. They will surrender 40 points or more in four regular season games. And if you want to lower that to 30, add in Notre Dame, add in Arizona, potentially add in Colorado, potentially Stanford, potentially Cal. I mean, this, this team could surrender 30 points to nearly any, any Pac-12 team. But Washington, Oregon, Utah, I mean, Utah will just run the football all over USC again. Washington... Washington has good corners, very underrated corners, and very underrated defensive ends. So they're going to match up well against USC's offense with their defensive scheme and roster strengths there. Plus, their offense is going to be nearly unstoppable. It'll be one of the best in the country. Oregon, it's a road game. I think Oregon is going to be worse than Utah and Washington, but it's a road game. USC's playoff hopes will already be over by the time they enter outs in stadium, and Oregon... Good defensive ends. They're going to be weak at corner, but with Troy Franklin, Bucky Irving, and Bo Nix, they will tear that defense apart. So it's better that it happens now than in Big Ten play, but USC is basically a unanimous top 10 or top 5 team entering the 2023 season. 
I have USC just inside of my top 15, so I would classify this as a bold prediction nationally, but from my own perspective, I think this is kind of what I expect. Part of me doesn't even view this as a bold prediction, so tell me your thoughts specifically on this prediction down in the comments section below. Do you think this is a bold prediction or not? And what do you think of USC? Because I'm very curious. They're going to be entering the Big Ten sooner rather than later. And the more I can learn about them and the more I can get a national perspective on what USC football is or what people think when they think of USC football, the better. Now we're going to move on to Michigan State. The Michigan State Spartans will win six or more games. Their preseason win total, last time I checked, was four and a half. In my opinion, they have the toughest schedule in the country. So even from my own perspective, I could see this being a bold prediction. The difference is I think Michigan State is going to be close to a top 25 team. Not quite, but they will be close. The problem for the Spartans, of course, is they face Washington, much like USC does, and then Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. All four of those teams will be top 10, in my opinion. You could actually round it up and say all four of those teams will be in the top eight if there was an eight-team playoff, and it was all auto bids for the best teams in the country. I think all four of those teams would be in there. And then Minnesota and Iowa, who I think are top 20 teams, are also on Michigan State's schedule. And Minnesota and Iowa are road games. Washington, Michigan are home games. Penn State's a neutral site, and Ohio State's a road game. That schedule is tough. So to go six and six, or even seven and five, I think seven and five is actually more likely than five and seven. Iowa, Minnesota, Washington, Penn State are games where Michigan State could pull something out could win, and don't count out the Michigan game either, as Mel Tucker has a 2-1 and one record versus Jim Harbaugh, which is unfathomable because he's also 1-2 and two versus Tom Allen. I digress. Michigan State has an above-average to good staff. Their front seven is going to be stacked. It's going to be one of the best in the country. Their offensive line is its most physical and healthiest since 2015. Their tight end room is the deepest, and I don't know how long, but Malik Carr, he's coming back. Noah Kim, who had a few touchdown passes in garbage time last season, looked good in the spring game and looked great in garbage time last season when he was subbed in for Peyton Thorne in the Ohio State and Minnesota games. He's going to be the starting quarterback as Thorne's now at Auburn, or he will probably be the starting quarterback. Maybe Robbie Ashford can replace him, but Michigan State doesn't care anymore. They're moving on as a program. They also lost Keon Coleman, which was their biggest loss there, but they return wide receiver Trey Mosley. I think there's a lot going for Michigan State, more than most would care to or want to admit. The problem is their schedule. So even though I think Michigan State is going to drastically improve from their 2022 selves, this team will perform at a level much closer to their 2021 unit with Kenneth Walker than their unit last year, which was banged up with injuries and was one of the most mismanaged teams in my mind in the entire Big Ten last year. Their roster was literally designed to run an air raid, and the defense was plagued with injuries the pass rush specialist Brandon Jordan that was brought in and hyped up all preseason didn't seem to do much because the pass rush was horrible. And the offense run the football, whether it was first and 10, second and 10, third and nine, because Michigan State couldn't run the football. So they were giving away plays when they ran the football. When you have Keon Coleman, Jaden Reed, Daniel Barker, and Malik Carr, and Peyton Thorne, it was a very mismanaged team. And that made me doubt somewhat Mel Tucker and his staff. But the roster this year is built to run, in my opinion. It's built to stop the run. And the secondary with incoming corners coach Jim Salgado, the secondary should be better. Also, Michigan State's bringing in a transfer cornerback from Iowa and Wisconsin. Both were backups at those schools, and they returned cornerback Charles Brantley, who almost left the program through the portal, but was convinced to return. 
I think they will win six games. If I had to not choose six, but either five or seven, I would lean with seven and five as opposed to five and seven. I think Noah Kim will pass for nearly 3,000 yards and pass for over 25 touchdowns. I think he'll run for nearly 200 yards on the ground as well. Simeon Barrow, Jacoby Winman, maybe Derek Harmon as well, and maybe Cal Halliday could be all Big Ten defensive players. Malik Carr, along with J.D. Duplain, Nick Samak, and potentially running back Nathan Carter, and Noah Kim even, could be all Big Ten offensive players players. Is this team elite? No. Are they great? No. But are they good? Yes. They just have a schedule that is the toughest in the country. So even though record-wise, it will look like they barely improved at all, if you watch the games for Michigan State this year, you will see the drastic improvements that they have. I, I think outside of the Ohio State game, which is a a bad mismatch waiting to happen for how Michigan State plays football and where they are at the secondary position, I think Michigan State will be competitive for at least, for I'd say at least a half in all the games they play outside of the Ohio State game, which is on the road in Columbus. So they'll surpass their preseason win total of four and a half, not just by a game going five and seven again, but they will reach a bowl game, go six and six, and much like USC, they'll be undervalued going into their bowl game. They will, their record, despite being worse than many teams, if you have three losses, there will be 10 and two, 11 and one teams potentially from the group of five who will have better records than you do. And for Michigan State, there'll be seven and five, eight and four, nine and three teams with better records. But the Trojans and the Spartans similarly will be better than teams that have a higher winning percentage because of their strength of schedule, strength of record, and if you watch the games, I think that we will all see those come to fruition. So I think Michigan State will likely win their bowl game if they do reach one, and I think that they will. Bold prediction number nine. Both Kansas and Kansas State will win 10 or more games for the first time since 1995. I didn't think that either of those these teams won 10 games in the same season, but Apparently they have. Apparently they have. 1995, both teams went 10-2. and two. That's when Bill Snyder was coaching Kansas State and Glenn Mason was coaching Kansas. Glenn Mason also later coached at the University of Minnesota. Both of these teams now, I've updated my top 25 and I'm soon going to be releasing a summer top 25 video along with a summer Big Ten predictions video and SEC, Pac-12, potentially ACC and Big 12, but we'll have to see. Definitely Big 10, SEC, Pac-12, and Top 25 for sure. Kansas has entered my Top 25 yet again. They were there in my winter Top 25, and Kansas State remains there. I think both will win 10 games. Now, whether it comes in the regular season or one of them gets a, a bowl win in the postseason, and that gets them from 9-3 and three to 10-3, and three, for example, we'll have to wait and see. I'm not going to go as far as to say that both will win 10 games in the regular season, because Kansas is still a growing team. Just by saying they'll win 10 games in general, and including the postseason, it makes it more likely for this prediction to come true, especially since I believe that Kansas's ceiling as a program right now, is probably 10 wins, and that might be stretching it, even. I think that these teams both face Texas, both face Texas, Kansas State faces Texas on the road, and so does Kansas, and both teams also do play UCF. Both have a Power 5 non-conference opponent. Kansas hosts Illinois in Week 2. Kansas State travels to Missouri in Week 3. So these schools will be battle-tested. The Big 12, I think, will be a very entertaining conference to watch. It will be one of the worst Power 5 conferences, even with Texas and Oklahoma still being in there, as Texas, I think, is the only team that can realistically compete on a national championship level, and really even a New Year's Six Bowl level. However, 
That doesn't mean you can't have entertaining football. And I think TCU, Kansas, Kansas State, Baylor, BYU, Oklahoma, there are so many schools outside of Texas. Oh, don't forget about Texas Tech either. Outside of Texas, those schools and maybe some others that I'm missing, maybe Iowa State under Matt Campbell can have a bounce back here. There will be entertaining football and there will be upsets. I think Texas is a top 15, top 10 team. I currently have them in my top 10 still. However, in saying that, we know from watching Texas football, also watching Oklahoma under Lincoln Riley, where they were basically guaranteed to lose a regular season game to whether it was Kansas State or Iowa State or even Texas in 2018, upsets are commonplace, not just in college football, but especially in the Big 12, a conference which used to be known for all offense, no defense. Some thought that reputation might go away when Baylor won the Big 12 in 2021. And then TCU showed up. TCU having nearly a top 10 scoring offense and having a scoring defense that finished the year residing outside of the top 90. So there's that. Kansas is all offense, no defense. We know this. Kansas State is one of the more solid, tough, physical programs in the Big 12. They kind of remind me of Michigan State under Mark D'Antonio, or Utah under Kyle Whittingham, or Oregon State under Jonathan Smith, or Iowa in Wisconsin under Kirk Ferentz and Paul Christ, respectively. You know what you're going to get from Kansas State. Former Alabama quarterback Greg McElroy said it perfectly on his college football podcast. You just, you know what you're going to get. They return offensive line men Cooper Beebe, who is an All-American offensive guard, and they return all of their other offensive line starters. Kansas is second in all Power 5 schools in returning production, trailing only Florida State. They also used the transfer portal to bring in former five-star offensive tackle Logan Brown from Wisconsin. They have Devin Neal and David Hishaw at running back, one of the better running back duos in the nation, potentially the best in the Big 12. At wide receiver, they have Luke Grimm. At quarterback, I think they have the deepest quarterback room in the country. Jason Bean, potentially the best backup quarterback in the country. And Jalen Daniels, who was a frontrunner for the Heisman Trophy before injury, he's returning as well. And Andy Kotelnecki, their offensive coordinator, very creative kind of guy. I, I think just with all this returning production, the continued development of the roster, I think this team is going to explode. They're going to explode in 2023. Kansas State, like I've said several times, you know what you're going to get from them, but when you return all your offensive linemen, when Will Howard, who took over for an injured Martinez last year and became the starter, looked phenomenal in most games that he played in. He could be a dark horse Heisman candidate. Also, Keegan Johnson, a wide receiver from Iowa who is underutilized there, is transferring in to help offset some of the de departing production. Tight end Ben Sinat returns, and defensively, they lose a lot there. They'll be vulnerable on the defensive line and at the secondary. They'll be okay at linebacker, but Kansas State is another team where with defensive coordinator Joe Klanderman, they're set. And again, for probably the nth time now, you know what you're going to get. So Kansas State will probably be in the top half of the Big 12 in defense and in offense. I expect their offense to take a step forward despite losing Deuce Vaughn just because of all that production up front, a better quarterback, a healthier quarterback, a wide receiver core that won't take many steps back, and returning production with one of the nation's better tight ends. I'm going to go further with this prediction and say that Kansas State will once again play in the Big 12 title game. In order to show that to you, though, I want to go over their schedule. I think that the Kansas State Wildcats will go 3-0 in non-conference, beating Southeast Missouri, Troy, and Missouri on the road, which is going to be a tough game. Missouri's also high in returning production, much like Kansas. Speaking of which, it would be very cool to see the border war resume. That would be a very intriguing rivalry. In 2007, I think that that was not number one versus number two, or it might have been close to it, but it was a it was a highly ranked matchup. I think it might have been one versus two in that border war game in 2007, which 
Missouri won. They lost to Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game. They finished 12-2, winning their bowl game. Kansas went 11-1 and beat Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl. So Missouri and Kansas got 12 wins, both in the same season in that chaotic 2007 season. Kansas even received a first-place vote because they were one of the only teams to only suffer one loss that entire year with Aqib Tlaib, an amazing corner there on defense, and Mark Mangino as head coach. So could Kansas and Kansas State and Missouri have phenomenal seasons? Absolutely, but I think Kansas State, to circle back to the topic at hand, is going to go into Missouri and win. They'll beat UCF, they'll beat Oklahoma State and Texas Tech back-to-back on the road, they'll host TCU and go 2-1 and one over the past two years over TCU, losing in an embarrassing way on the road due to injuries in the regular season last year and avenging that loss in the Big 12 championship game. They'll beat Houston after that, but then they have a road trip to Texas, and I think Texas, who beat Kansas State last year in Manhattan, Texas, they're going to be tougher this season. They're going to be much better on offense in the passing department especially, and defensively they'll remain a stout team, so I think Kansas State will pick up a loss there. They'll beat Baylor, they'll lose to rival Kansas in the Sunflower Showdown, and they'll beat Iowa State to close out the season. Due to tiebreakers and a win over Baylor, I have Baylor also going 7-2 and in Big 12 Conference play. They will advance to the Big 12 Championship game, Kansas State will, where they will lose to Texas again. Texas just has too much talent. Texas has the better wide receiver core, better tight ends. They have, I would say, equal or maybe better running backs. Um, Kansas State, this is a bold prediction of mine, I think might have the better quarterback compared to Quinn Ewers at Texas, but Quinn Ewers definitely has the higher ceiling than Will Howard does. And I think Texas also has more depth and talent on defense, and they have the potential to match Kansas State's offensive line as well. From there, Kansas State, I think, is going to match up in a bowl game versus Oregon, where they will lose. So I think 10-4 and four for Kansas State, much like last year, except instead of winning the Big 12 championship game, they will lose the Big 12 championship game. But they will appear there nonetheless. Kansas, I'm going to quickly run through their schedule and even their bowl projection, give you a sneak peek of that, and then we'll end out this video. I think Kansas beats Missouri State, Illinois, Nevada. BYU is a very physical squad who can run the football and is explosive on offense at times, so I think they beat Kansas in Kansas' own house. Kansas will lose to Texas on the road, but beat UCF, win at Oklahoma State, and beat Oklahoma for the first time in I don't know how many years. They'll then lose at Iowa State, at home to Texas Tech. Well, they'll beat Texas Tech, my apologies. Beat rival Kansas State and win at Cincinnati before matching up with NC State in their own bowl game and winning that to finish 10-3, and 6-3 in the Big 12 Conference. So, 10 wins for both of the Kansas schools. Michigan State will surpass their preseason win total, and USC will miss the Pac-12 championship game they won't even reach a New Year's Six Bowl, and Alex Grinch will be fired as USC looks to re revamp and improve and adapt to Big Ten play. Thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and comment your thoughts down below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all around. Bye-bye.